Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is John Pitt. I'm the Acting Operations Manager of the Grand National Museum. And this evening, um, we are happy to have you here for... We've been short of a lecture for a long time, so, you know, we're happy to have you here. We're just happy to be having a lecture. <laughs> um, I want to say a special um, welcome to Mr. Steve Fram, the U.S. Charles de Affairs. Okay, thank you for joining us. Tonight's lecture is part of the museum's effort to offer a forum for visiting and local scholars to present their research to the public. For over 41 years, the museum was established in 1976, so we've been here 41 years. The museum has served as an integral venue for public education, particularly regarding the island's historic and prehistoric heritage. So today we are very happy to introduce somewhat of an in-house scholar. I first met him as part of the Peace Corps volunteer program. Um, he was teaching computers at the Methodist School in Queens Park. He eventually ran a youth archaeology program at the St. John's River site, and then he helped to renovate the Amerindian exhibit that we have downstairs. Um, Actually, he's planning to update that exhibit again soon from the research that has been ongoing. After he left in 2013, Jonathan got a master's degree in anthropology at Penn State and was accepted into the doctorate program there, for which he's nearing completion. He comes to us this evening as a Fulbright Scholar of the U.S. Embassy attached to the Ministry of Tourism. He has been back every year since 2013, and I am sure that he will continue for some time. During his stay last summer, he began cataloging the museum's entire Amerindian collection. We have some 60,000 plus artifacts in storage, so that's been a big project and it's ongoing. And we, you know, we expect it to be a tremendous resource. Once that cataloging is complete, you know, we're going to get it online, we hope, and you know, we have access to it from wherever. So. It's something that we're excited about, seeing the completion of. He also recently compiled a comprehensive inventory of every pre-Columbian archaeological site in Grenada, which he is now in the process of putting online as a public resource. Okay, I'm sure he will share a little bit more of that tonight. So without further ado, we're going to give Mr. Jonathan Hanna a warm welcome to the podium. Well, thank you for uh, coming out. I know at 5 o'clock, uh, lecture is hard to make sometimes. You don't know if you should eat dinner first or, or what, if it's really going to start on time. But we did pretty good. So, um, so I've given a, a version of this lecture a few different, to a few different groups. And I found that uh, if I just talk about my research, um, I get all these questions that uh, about Caribs and Arawaks and things that we learn in school. And I realized that I was kind of talking about something over here and that I wasn't addressing the, coming from the standpoint that people know, and there's this big gap in between. So a lot of this tonight will be uh, um, going over the common uh, conceptions and misconceptions uh, about the pre-Columbian Caribbean and Grenada specifically. Uh, so, the first part will mostly just be about what I do and what archaeology is and, and where it, how it fits in. So this is basically like what my uh, discipline is and where I'm coming from for the rest of the lecture, right? So, the basic question of what is archaeology? So a lot of people you know, might have a pretty well-formed idea, at least from Discovery Channel or History Channel or something like that, right? Um, going in the vein of Karl Popper, who was a philosopher, it's easier to define what something isn't than what it is, right? And modern statistics is based on this. So archaeology is not what we often think of the first images, right? And it's not Indiana Jones. In fact, I don't think he holds a trowel or digs an excavation ever. Maybe Raiders of the Lost Ark, he might, there's excavation. But it's like old, old world style. Uh, and then Tomb Raider, I don't think she does either. I'm not a, you know, these were great movies, though. and of course, I, you know, Indiana Jones had a huge impact on me as a kid, and of course that's why I ended up kind of going towards this. So it's not a bad thing, but 
it's not fighting Nazis, unfortunately. I never get to shoot any guns. And it's also not like, uh, you know, a lot of the shows you see on Discovery Channel and uh, the History Channel, like Ancient Aliens, things like this. Most of those kinds of shows are based on a very like small snippet of truth and then they run with it in some other fascinating or uh, uh, yeah, direction. So uh, it's also, a lot of times people will ask me about dinosaurs and I don't deal with dinosaurs at all. There are millions of years before humans, at least in the discipline of anthropology. And so I really only deal with humans. So it's, it's part of anthropology, which is a study of humans and especially human culture is a, is a major part of that. And so archeology span is the study of past cultures. Sometime in like 2012, uh, the Society for American Archaeology, who's like the flagship organization that most archaeologists in the U.S. are part of, um, began issuing guidelines to say, in every introductor, introductory class to archaeology, you must talk about pseudoscience and pseudoarchaeology, pseudohistory, because a lot of times the, the primary experience people have is from shows like Ancient Aliens which is directly a derivative of this book, Chariot of the Gods from the 60s, which was basically said that, you know, aliens visited the Earth thousands of years ago or millions, I'm not sure how far back in time he goes, but, and that they gave culture and civilization and language and all these things that create the modern world. You know, that all came from aliens, right? And then all these other books are sort of derivative from that. Fingerprints of the Gods, it's not aliens, it's white people with beards kind of look a lot like me. I mean, you go through the whole book, and at the end, it's white people with beards that traveled around the world and gave everybody civilization 10,000 years ago. So they take these little snippets of things, you know, a god that looks sort of like a man with a beard that maybe looks Greek or something, and then run with it, right? But they're not based on, a, on much fact. This, and the same thing with um, they came before Columbus. It's a very intriguing idea. Certainly Brazil... And, and Africa are very close, I mean, on a map. It's not that close to Mesoamerica, which is where he focuses most of the stuff on with Olmecs and Olmec heads, as this is a Mesoamerican giant head um, that has, that looks African features, but that, you know, art, artistic style is not enough evidence, at least in scientific terms. So I would love to believe that. I would love to find an alien spaceship or something, but that's what it would take <laughs> to prove that. So the idea is um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And most of the evidence that I find are little bits of ceramics and things like that that I'm building on under trying to understand what the ancient past was. You just, you can't, you know, it takes such a monumental body of evidence to prove something that, that these books have to go on. Of course, it's, again, just like Indiana Jones, it's a, it's a good way of, of sparking people's interest I wouldn't encourage getting too deep into it or really mess you up. I actually read one of those in high school when I was interested in archaeology, and it took me years to figure out um, what was wrong about it, and, you know, they really twisted. Oh, okay, I didn't finish this slide. <laughs> um, well, okay, part of that is that... Uh, so in archaeology, there have been some uh, pretty... Uh, some big claims over the years... Uh, that ended up being true. So one of them was the site of Lansdowne Meadows. I didn't actually uh, put any pictures of it, so I'm sorry. Uh, but this is a, a, a Viking site in Canada, right? Or actually another site, too. So in Newfoundland, Canada, in the 1960s, this, uh, these Swedish, I think they were Swedish archaeologists, found cow bones and metal objects associated with Amerindian objects, and they said they announced to the SAA, the Society for American Archaeology, that they had found a Viking site. They were pretty sure these Norsemen had made it to Canada. Nobody believed them, right? Archaeologists were completely incredulous, just, just like we are with Africans reaching Mesoamerica. Um, but they continued to work, and they documented things scientifically. And I'll talk about what this, how the science works. But everything's organized. It's, you're measuring things. You're carefully documenting everything. And within about a decade, they had radiocarbon dated those cow bones to about 900 AD. They had found swords that match the forms of Vikings. And then they went back into the oral history and identified the sagas that describe Leif Erikson and such that everyone thought were myth. 
so the oral history turned out to be true in this case. But they really failed at Lancel Meadows. It was, only, it was only about a generation that they lived there. They transported this Scandinavian economy of cows and goats and sheep to um, the Canadian winter, and they basically, it was very, almost like Jamestown later on. Jamestown was saved, but Lancel Meadows wasn't. So anthropology is a study of humans, and there are a couple uh, different sections of it, cold for anthropology, linguistic anthropology, and then physical anthropology and human evolution, and archeology, span which is the study of past cultures. And we deal with cultural evolution a lot. But it's a science, right? It's organized. So if you look at some of these images, um, these are our samples, uh, excavation pits, right? And look how square everything is and um, neatly done. That's because if you're digging a one by one meter excavation, that's your sample. You want 100% of that sample. You don't want it to go into a bathtub at the bottom you know, or slant, right? So you, um, so these are some students that I worked with a couple years ago at the St. John's River site, and they did, they did a pretty good job with getting those this pits uh, straight walls and everything. You're supposed to be able to drop a penny down the side, and it should just hit the bottom. And you and if you go level by level, you're kind of peeling back the, you know, rolling back the levels and trying to see where an ancient surface might be, what's going on, how it connects to other pieces, right? So what artifacts in one pit connect to another pit? And, it's, and you measure everything to the point that you, can, that you can reconstruct everything, usually within about a 10 centimeter um, accuracy, both horizontally on Earth, so you know exactly where that excavation was, or exactly where that little ceramic was on Earth, both horizontally and how deep it was, so that every shirt within about a 10 centimeter, so that you could reconstruct something like this. And this is a medieval setting, but. It, it shows how complex it can get. You have walls, you have pits, you have people digging from one time into another, and things are getting moved around. Um, and it's really difficult to understand what's happening if, if you just go and dig something up, right? So you need to document everything. And just like any science, you know, we have field books where we're constantly writing and recording and measuring. And well, a lot of it is just this. So this is basically my life for about a month. Every year I get to go out and dig, and then for the other 11 months, I'm mostly just on a computer figuring out what it was that we, do, that we did. So if you want to be an archaeologist, if there's anyone that was thinking about it, it's just like any job, really. You're in front of a computer a lot. So, uh, oh, this, so this material culture um, was getting into sort of anthropology, and we use a lot of the artifacts, including features like pyramids. This is a uh, from the site at Tikal in Guatemala, and you can see it looked like just a hill, and when they excavated, they left half of it um, unfinished so people could see what it looked like before they reconstructed it. Uh, but so those are sort of evidence of culture. They're, they reflect the culture that built them, and here's examples of some of our bags. These are bags that like students at St. John's River, Queens Park wrote, and you can see level one, the date, you know, their names, and level one, I know exactly how deep that level is, like zero to 10 centimeters below the surface. And then the other, some of that's from, uh, from the museum upstairs. So all this difference, differ, uh, differs a lot from looting, right? So the, the best example in Grenada is, is pearls, where you could drive up in your car and buy a whole bag of adornos. Um, those little animal figurine, ceramic figurines, I'll have some more pictures of them. Uh, and they're all just taken. The guy might not even know exactly where it came from, right? And a lot of times, they're just taking the good stuff. So this example is uh, burial. You know, usually people in the past were buried with all sorts of nice things and nice designs and nice pottery. And that's what they'll go after. They'll take that and then all the food bones that would tell you what they ate, all the seeds, plants, you know, any of the plainware pottery that might actually be more informative than the design. And the actual bones themselves might just be discard disregarded. Um, of course, I don't blame the guy selling this at, at, at Pearl. I kind of blocked his face out, and some people might know who he is. Yeah, I think he still sells up there. Uh, you know, he's just, I'd rather him be doing that than like selling drugs or whatever, right? I mean, it's, it's really kind of a benign thing when you, in the grand scheme of things. It's really the people buying it that are creating the market and encouraging him to go back and buy more. So I don't blame him too much. He's just trying to make some money. He's poor. 
One thing I'll get into later is how to make this kind of situation benefit everybody in a sustainable way. You know, once you loot everything, it's gone forever. The site's done. If you, once you take all the artifacts out, it's almost like oil in the sense that it's a finite resource that's, once it's gone, it's gone, right? And it's also like oil or water or some of these other kinds of resources where it's kind of a free-for-all, take as much as you can before it runs out, right? And it's hard to manage a situation like that when there's not, no one taking ownership or, so it, it's a difficult situation. Okay, so before um, I switch gears and start moving into prehistory, does anyone have any questions about any of the stuff that I had? Uh, just talk just general archaeology or anthropology. Okay, so the Caribbean. I'm going to start off this section with um, a pretty bold statement that uh, many archaeologists wouldn't think is very bold. If I gave this same talk at the Caribbean Archaeology Conference, people would be like, Caribs don't exist. We knew that. But uh, it's still a prevalent thing, and most, you know, you hear it all the time, right? And what I mean is that caribs don't exist in the, in the way we, we know, in the way we were taught, in the way we think about them. Um, they never even called themselves caribs. That, that was what Europeans called them. Um, the same thing with Arawaks and Taino, Ukayans, any of these groups. They didn't really exist uh, in the sense that they weren't really the cohesive group we think of them as. For instance, every island had their own name for themselves. Eventually, they would call themselves this, like the same way that Indian, Native American Indians might call themselves an Indian. You go throughout South America, an indigenous person that's you know, descended from people that were here before Columbus would call themselves an Indio. And they probably have another name for themselves, but they're communicating something. It's just a way to package a lot of information easily. Everybody knows Indian, what that means, in the sense of an indigenous person, right? It doesn't mean that they're from India. So the same things with Caribs, even though the name Caribbean is derived from the word Carib. It's not what they call themselves. In fact, uh, this is a quote from a friar. I, I was in Guyana. Uh, he wrote this, uh, uh, an account of his, his journeys in 1622. And it seems, he seems to be mentioning Grenada. It was in French, so this is translated. And it's kind of in the same paragraph where he says, the island of Grenada... And he's, he's, he's just repeating what people had told him. It's populated with Carib Indians named Kamahugas. Hence the name Camerhone, Kamahuga. Okay, so you get these little snippets of things of what maybe they, used to, they would call themselves. Same thing with Kalinago they, and Kalina. These are names that some people would call themselves, but not everybody or not at all always at the same time or you know, it depends the group that they're with or who they're talking to. Uh, a lot of it has to do with Columbus. So nobody uh, in 1492 or any, no one, no scholars really thought the world was flat. Right? That's kind of a misnomer that people thought the world was flat. Maybe common people thought the world was flat. I think there's still a group that claims the world is flat. But um, most scholars knew the world was round. And since the Greeks, they knew the world was round. Uh, I think it's Aristotle, someone like that, that said, you know, you see um, a boat on the horizon. What's the first thing you see? is the sails, right? If the world was flat, you would see the whole boat just appear. Instead, so they knew the world was round. The problem was they thought the world was so big and that the ocean between China and Europe was so vast, and maybe there were monsters or whatever, but it wasn't feasible, especially economically feasible, to go to China that way, right? And that's what Columbus was trying to say, was that the world was smaller, and he based a lot of it on Tuscalini's map. Um, this guy also thought the world was a little smaller. I mean, they didn't know there was a whole other continent, you know, the new North and South America, right? So this color version of that is, um, is Tuscalini's map, and then uh, it's overlaid with uh, a modern map, so you can see kind of where things were and where Columbus thought he was, why he thought he was in Japan or, uh, or Sapangu or Antilia, which is a mystical Greek island. They weren't sure if it existed or not, but it's on... It's on the map. As soon as Columbus arrives, of course, he starts renaming everything. He lands on an island they called Guanahani. You know what it is? I, I think I mispronounced it because I didn't. He names it Santo Domingo, right? But that's not what they called it. They said it was something else. This is Santo Domingo. You're all now 
you know, under the, the rule of Isabella and King Ferdinand, you're all Spanish subjects. You know, just, just like that. Um, and he starts renaming everything. So the same thing with the people that Arawaks and Taino and Caribs, things just get really misconstrued. And there's about a 15,000 year gap between when people first leave Asia and Siberia and make it into the new world. So we're talking about about a 15 year, 15,000 year just void between cultures. So the communication wasn't, wasn't so great. I have my uh, story of our islands, right? Most of us know this book pretty well. I think the adults here read the same thing, and this is what they still use. I think it was first published in 1957. Usually you read, um, I don't know, the fifth or sixth grade, 10 or 15 pages. And that's usually the bulk of what you get about the pre-Columbian Caribbean. Understandably, they have other things they're trying to focus on. I think they should deal with it a little more. But also, the, the book does a good job of distilling a lot of information for kids. And there's not a lot of books like that, so it's still in print. But this is mo what most people, um, including myself, because I didn't know that much about the Caribbean when I started the Peace Corps, right? And I was teaching at the Methodist school, I saw this book, and that's what kind of got me interested in some ways. But let me read um, just a quick passage. This is what most people usually think of as Carib. After centuries of peace, the Arawaks were followed to the islands by their old enemies, the Caribs. Caribs were shorter people than Arawaks, but stronger, fiercer, and in many ways more skillful. They were clever workers in wood and made canoes 40 feet in length, which would carry 40 men. The canoes were paddled by, by paddles, not by oars. Uh, later on, it says that the Caribs would attack the Arawaks, and they carried off Arawak women and girls, making them their wives and treating them as slaves. Arawak men would be killed or usually eaten. Okay. Now, this is what they still teach in schools, right? That Caribs are cannibals, and that they would rape and kill all the women. And, well, in some ways, there's a snippet of truth here about there is a rivalry between these groups, Caribs, what we would call Caribs and Arawaks, and the linguists have done a good job of putting together, based on languages, what people are speaking, how they're related. And they're... There is sort of a, a, a nascent um, origin of Arawakan languages and moving up into the Caribbean. The problem is that Caribs spoke an Arawakan language. They didn't speak a Caribbean language. That is that the dictionaries in the 1650s, um, a couple dictionaries, especially uh, Bretons, are written by these missionaries in the Lesser Antilles and their work, they're living with Caribs and they're recording everything. That's where you get the name Cam Cameroon and things like that. Uh, it's from Breton. And these are Dominican Caribs that he used, Caribe as he called them. It's all in French. Well, linguists have since gone back, and a good book that summarizes a lot of this is um, Granberries and Vestalis's 2004 book, in the corner there. Uh, they, pull, they pull out all the words, and they start comparing them to languages that are known in South America, and everything is Arawakan. There are some Caribbean words, but they're kind of, they seem to be a trade language. It's like a pidgin kind of thing. So the men may have spoken a pidgin Caribbean language to trade in South America, but the idea that they're stealing all the women and, and that the women are Arawakan and the men are Caribbean is, is, is a misnomer. I mean, that would only, how many generations would that last for? I mean, here they say, after a time, the only Arawaks remaining on the islands were the women who had been married or enslaved by the conquerors. Well, wouldn't they eventually be Caribs? Like, wouldn't their daughters be Caribs then? And it would only last a generation. It doesn't really hold up when you think logically. And, and when you look at the, lingu the languages, it's Arawakan. So um, this is kind of a, it's hard to see. These are some um, of the South American languages. And here's one in the Caribbean. And here's the one spoken by Taino. It's kind of a, a, a dialect, Arawakan dialect. And then Island Carib is right there next to it. They basically spoke almost the same language, very similar language here and in Greater Antilles. And yet they were often called Carib and Taino or Carib and Arawak, right? So these are just things Europeans applied to them. Often if someone attacked a European ship, Spanish or French, they would say they were Caribs. There are actually evidence of some of these same 
people being called Taino, and then later they run into them and they attack the Spanish, and they call them Caribs, and they're the same people. So it was more a European or a colonial category, as uh, some archaeologists have, have said. Another problem is that um, there have not been any Carib sites. Well, I should say up until the 1990s, there were no Carib sites. So despite you might hear, oh, this is a Carib site or that's a Carib site, there was no definitive Carib sites. There were no sites that actually dated to contact period in 1650 in Grenada, right? Well, uh, one thing I should say about this, one little nuance of this is that the dictionary is written in 1650, right? Columbus arrived, the first Europeans arrived in 1492, 1500. So there's a 150 year difference. And there's also a, probably a lot of Taino moving down into Lesser Antilles, uh, escaping all the, the genocide happening in Greater Antilles because they, they enslaved them and by them work in mines and things like that, right? I mean, that part is true in the Greater Antilles. Um, so there was, a massive depopulation in Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, the Leeward Islands, and Bahamas. Um, and uh, so, so it's possible then that maybe some of them moved down into the Lesser Antilles and that's why they're speaking Arawakan language, when really there were caravan speakers and it's all mixed up 150 years later. That is a possibility, so I won't roll that completely. So the issue of carib sites is that every time we've, even documents we have, uh, that say, oh, the, you know, we met Caribs here and we traded with them. When we go and excavate that area, it turns out to be a totally different site. It's either earlier than we thought, like 600 AD, we call Saladoid, or, or it's Swayzoid, which is, I'll get into, which is a, based on Svan Swayze, a site up in St. Patrick's, which was thought to be Carib, but was later disproved. And one of my theories, which I'll get into, is maybe it wasn't completely wrong. All of the uh, ethnographic evidence that we have, or ethnohistoric evidence, seem to show that Caribs were recent arrivals. This is of whoever the Caribs were, right? They were recent arrivals. And so they would have been making a type of pottery that would be similar to that made in the Guyanas, especially, and in South America. So it wouldn't be that different. So whatever was being done here, you would see a massive change. And so one of the problems is we didn't see a change. All the pottery that we found shows a nice continuation. I mean, you can see exactly how things change over time in situ without anyone coming in and, and killing everybody, right? And taking the women and burning the village. So uh, in the 1970s, a guy named Dr. Kirby from St. Vincent identified a pottery called Cayo, and he thought it was earlier. And then eventually um, a, a guy at uh, Leiden, uh, Ari Brumert, argued pretty persuasively that it was actually exactly like this pottery that you see in the Guyanas around the time of contact. And it turns out he was right and they started finding more sites that had this pottery going back and re-identifying things. So we do have Carib sites. But are they Carib as we have been saying? Are they the, are they the Caribs that we think of or are they somebody else? So for Grenada, when the French first arrived, 1649, the first permanent settlement, right? Um, they write an account about 10 years after they arrived in 1659. And the story of Leapers Hill and everything is, is in there. And that's what probably all the stories of Leapers Hill that we've heard are derived from that original document. The French describe two different people. They're describing Caribe and Galibis. A lot of times they're treated as the same group, Galibis and, and Caribs, uh, or they're all just called Kalina, which would be another name that the Galibis would call themselves. Um, and the, hence, you get things on the map, like um, this is a map of Grenada. And David, you have the site of Galbi Bay, which on earlier maps was called Anse de Galibis, right? And um, I'll show you some pottery from there, and it's a Galibi site. Also, the story of Leapers Hill isn't really just Caribs, it's Caribs and Galibis. So they say they attack a group of drinking Caribs and Galibis. So they seem very similar, but the French are making a differentiation here between these two groups somehow. And it's not really clear. Of course, they're giving them these names. They're not, nobody says they're a Galibi, nobody says they're a Carib, right? But somehow they're making this differentiation. I think it has to do with the language. As I said, the Caribs were speaking an Arawakan language. These Galibis are from the mainland. 
Galibi is a word that the French would use to describe a group in Guyana uh, at the time of contact. So here's a, this is from 1757, but, uh, and by that time, this group had really um, consolidated and they, they uh, embraced trading with, with Europeans, and so they really expanded during the colonial period. Um, but the, you have uh, depictions of what the pottery would look like, and, and these people speak a caravan language. So maybe these are the Caribs. So in Grenada, you have Galibis who are probably speaking a Caribbean language, and maybe that's why the French are calling them Galibis. And you have this people from Salteris Bay, for instance, they're calling Caribs, but who, who are they? Uh, well, so here's the site of Galby Bay, this is an example. So uh, if you remember, you notice from that picture, you see these Samaku jars, these big, uh, they were like cassava beer usually is in them, some, usually some kind of alcohol. Uh, same kind of vessel was found at Galby Bay. And um, Cayo pottery, which we've now established as, as Carib pottery at Galby Bay. But the site is really short-lived, and the radiocarbon dates nearby from Latant, which also seems to be the same period, is pretty late. We're talking like 1300 AD. Um, I'll show you the radiocarbon dates. We don't have the radiocarbon dates from Galby Bay. Uh, but we do have them from the Tant, just over the peninsula. Okay, so Sauter's Bay. Now, these are this is this is the site that was ostensibly attacked during um, the Leapers Hill incident. There might have been another area of use closer to the town itself, but it's all you know destroyed now. It's all underneath the town. But just east of or just west of Little St. Patrick's River. Um, is a big site with a lot of different loci that um, an archaeologist named uh, Ann Cody dug in 1994. Uh, and she found loads of the stuff we call uh, Swayze pottery. And then she also found a piece of Cayo, but just one piece. Um, and there were also some burials, things like that. But the radiocarbon dates, uh, if you look at the top there, these are the ranges, show almost continuous occupation from about 700 AD, even going back into 16, 600 AD, all the way up to contact period. And you can see it, the last date goes just a little bit over 1600. So probably contact period, we don't have a definite, although we do have some historic pottery and there's cow bones and stuff like that on the top levels of the site um, and associated with the Cayo pottery. But down at the lower levels, you have the Swayze stuff. These people, that leapt off the hill with the Galibis were actually the, maybe the original indigenous people that had first colonized Grenada. And they were just being called Caribs, they're being called invaders when they most likely invaded uh, an empty place originally, right? And they had been living there a thousand years. I mean, 600 AD is 1600 AD, right? So indigenous people, um, are derived from an Asiatic people that moved into the New World at least about 15,000 years. That date is being pushed closer to 20,000 years. And, um, you know, even this book talks about the uh, Beringia, land, the land bridge between Asia and where people would have crossed. The problem is that, with this, is that uh, right when we're pretty sure that land bridge was forming and people could cross it, there's sites down in like South America popping up 15, thousand years ago. So you have radiocarbon dates that are popping up at uh, sites like Monteverde and others. There's even one in Pennsylvania that's about the same time. The Yucatan, all, all right when people are supposed to be coming over. So we're pretty sure they had boats and there might have been an earlier wave. And, and we know that there was probably a couple waves of people coming over for, for a while. Around five to six thousand years, people started to move into the Caribbean. So this is pretty late. This is after agriculture. This is after plants are domesticated. Corn was domesticated about eight, 000, eight to 9,000 years ago. So the people moving in, they have, I mean, they're, they're still hunter-gatherers, but they, they do seem to plant things. A lot of the earliest tree crops and stuff show up about five or 6,000 years ago. <laughs> but, uh, but it all seems to be coming from Central America at this time. So you have uh, these two archaic groups that one in South America and one in um, Central America. And it seems like the one in Central America moves in first. And there seems to be an interaction period, uh, area up in the Leeward Islands where they're kind of exchanging things. The way we're able to differentiate this is that the Central American ones, they make these stone tools that are like hammer and pecked. 
They make these blades, like you would imagine if you're making a stone tool, right? You're just hacking. But uh, down in South America, the technology was really a ground stone thing. So you think of ground stone uh, axes and things like that. Um, these like smooth, it's a kind of a different kind of technology. And so there are no like uh, blades that we know of like down in South America at the time, but there seems to be some interaction. One issue with this though is that they only really appear in Trinidad, um, particularly the site of or Ortier, which is what they're named the Ortroids. And then they skip the Lesser Antilles entirely. So there's no archaic people in Grenada. There's no evidence of anybody making stone tools um, before the ceramic making people. We do have stone tools, but they're associated with ceramics and at the time of contact you have people still using stone tools. So it could be from any time period. Whereas up in the Greater Antilles and especially the Leeward Islands, you have archaic sites all over that, that date to um, at the earliest five to 6,000 years and then going, going on. Now one issue is that, of course, sea level has changed. So sites could be underwater. You know, people moving in from Trinidad or South America could have sat on the beach and just kept moving. Uh, but the same would be true of the Leeward Islands and Greater Antilles, and yet you have archaic sites all over. There was um, the uh, Caribbean Archaeology uh, Conference two years ago was in St. Martin, and you know we go around the island, and St. Martin has tons of archaic sites. They were just all over. It's a little island. I think it's smaller than... Think. There's, they're all over the place. So why weren't they in Grenada or St. Vincent or Dominica or St. Lucia? In fact, the, so you have two, two islands seem to maybe have these archaic people, and that's uh, Barbados and Martinique. Now, the Martinique site is pretty, it seems pretty short. The Barbados one is just a couple conch shells that date to that time period. There's nothing else that's associated with them. So you could probably just go on the beach and find a conch shell that maybe is 5,000 years old. It's just, you don't know when, when it died and it's just, you know, they last a long time. So that's a really iffy thing if they made it to Barbados and then they skipped everything else. But there have been some intriguing evidence. One of them was a series of pollen cores that were taken, um, two of them in Grenada uh, at um, Meadow Beach, right out, outside of Pearls, and Lake Antoine. So pretty close. And they showed potential human disturbance around 5,000, four to 5,000 years ago. Um, and the, but the, the way they define that is mostly, this here is charcoal, charcoal signal. So you have this long core of soil that you pulled out of the lake and you go through it and you look for seeds and little bits of, of plant material and, you, and pollen right under a microscope and also charcoal. The charcoal, would, people would consider that an indication of human presence, making fires. But of course, fires can happen naturally. There's lightning, you have dry, really dry seasons and you have bad storms, you could get fires. So one um, criticism of this is that they just kind of draw these lines randomly, especially the one from Lake Antoine, there's a clear charcoal signal earlier, and they say that's natural, and then the one after that is, is humans, and it's kind of, it's, I would much rather have believed them if they said it was the first one. Another issue is that um, there's no direct evidence of humans. Some of the archaic plants that were brought in here are mostly tree crops, so you have papaya, avocado, soursop. A lot of these things are actually legacies of these first people that moved in, but you don't see that in the pollen cores. So without that sort of intrusive taxa, as we would call it, it's just a really intriguing thing. Maybe there were archaic people here, here's a little piece of evidence, but it's not um, definitive enough. So at the moment, this idea of a stepping stone of people moving, especially this is the archaic people moving through time uh, up to the Greater Antilles, is really just an idea and hypothesis and it needs a lot more testing. The same thing is discussed for ceramic making people. So around Around 500 BC, you have, uh, which is right, right around here, you have these uh, ceramic making people move in from South America. And this is the white on red pottery. It's a really nice pottery. So all of a sudden, you get beautiful pottery just showing up. So, I say, so a place like Grenada, you don't have archaic. We have nothing that shows archaic. And then all of a sudden, really amazing pottery that's well fired. There's not a lot of temper in the pottery. It's very clean and nice well decorated and stuff. There's pieces down in the uh, exhibit downstairs. Um, and it just shows up. So we know they, they moved in, they migrated in, right? This didn't happen naturally. You don't see a progression of people beginning to learn how to make paint and how to make pottery, it just shows up. And then in South America, 
You see it around the Orinoco River around 2000 BC. So we're pretty sure that's where they came from. They come out the Orinoco, just like stuff you find on the beach might be washed up from South America. And stuff. So they pretty much follow that same, that same route. But again, it's um, just like the archaic people, there's no dates for the earliest ones in the Lesser Antilles. So the earliest dates for all the Windward Islands are about 100 AD, and that's not even Grenada. So up in Puerto Rico, uh, about 500 BC, you have this movement of people. And in the Leeward Islands, you have these radiocarbon dates that show they were there. When we run the radiocarbon dates for Grenada, or St. Vincent, or Dominica, or St. Lucia, it's all much later. Similar kind of pottery, but much, much later. Uh, and so there's this thing called the southward route hypothesis that, oops, that they might be skipping. And, uh, this ideas about how they might have skipped the islands. They have a whole South American coastline that could have been the staging area. And we're not exactly sure what direction they left the Orinoco Valley. So they didn't have to go through Trinidad. Um, and a big problem with the stepping stone is that the, the population would have, would have had to be really high in order to populate each island and get to Puerto Rico by 500 BC. You would need a lot of people, especially if you're, you have a settlement, so you leave 50 people. You leave 50 people in St. Vincent. You leave, the, the population becomes higher than what it could have been from the South American um, origin. That, that's one argument. It's possible that they did. My research uh, was mostly targeting this idea that well, they might have skipped Grenada and St. Lucia and St. Vincent, but there wasn't enough work done here to know. I didn't feel like there was enough archaeology to say for sure. You know, there were just little bits of, of things that we knew about. Um, but nobody had really, there weren't even that many radiocarbon dates of these sites. So I, I was sure I was going to find an early Saladoid site. As it turns out, and this is still kind of preliminary because I'm in the middle of my research, but the preliminary results are that actually I think it might be right. So we have 84 sites that we know of, Amerindian sites in Grenada. Uh, I'll show this slide a, a couple times, but the red ones are what we call saladoid, they're the earliest ones, they're the white on red pottery. But these sites all date really late, they're about four or 500 AD. Like I said, in Puerto Rico, the same kind of pottery, but it's four or 500 BC. The earliest site that has always been proposed was Pearl, so for years everyone said Pearls was the earliest site. And you get all sorts of crazy ideas about how, how, what the age was. There were a couple of radiocarbon dates run, but even a book I, that was published this year, I saw they said it was 200 BC. It's actually 500 AD, the actual radiocarbon date. It's just been, people just keep repeating this. I mean, archeologists keep repeating this. I'll show you those dates in a second. So there have been about five projects since 1962 in Grenada, uh, beginning with a guy named Ripley Boland, who did a big survey of the island, um, and then Florida and, um, University of Florida, uh, a group called Foundation for Field Research. During the, the revolution, um, there was a French archeologist, uh, Henry Petit-Jean Berger, who uh, did a salvage excavation at Point Saline during the airport construction. Um, and then there's been a, a couple smaller groups, now there's Leiden and uh, now Penn State with me. So this was the Pearl site. One issue with Pearls was that we were pretty sure it was early. The pottery looked really early. Uh, like I said, the radiocarbon dates weren't really showing that. But, of course, an airport was built right through it. So there's things that are all mixed up. And there were also a lot of other issues. I showed you that picture of the trenches at Pearls. I mean, this site is massively disturbed. Um, that blue dot here is uh, the Cocoa Rehabilitation Project. Or in, the, in the 80s, actually took soil from Pearls because it's really fertile and, and good soil and moved it elsewhere in the country uh, as part of a cocoa rehabilitation thing. And I was stopped, but it took about two years to do it. And in the process, they created all these little fake pearl sites. So there is little pockets of adornos and things that you would find at pearls elsewhere in the country, but nobody actually lived there. It's from pearls. But the radiocarbon dates for pearls. Okay, so here's pearls right here in the, in the box. Not those, but I'll talk about those. Uh, those are the dates. The one that's kind of... Um, grayed out a little, uh, is I think intrusive. So you had three dates, and they were taken in order. So you had an excavation, and you have these levels. And the top one should be the most recent, the bottom one should be the oldest. Really, even, even if they're 100 years difference, they should be, that's generally how it should be. Well, you had the oldest one in the middle, 
and the next oldest in the, in the bottom, and then the, the most recent, uh, or sorry, the most recent on the bottom, and then the middle one on the top. So clearly it had been sort of mixed up. And sort of reanalyzing some of this in a paper that I have coming out soon, I talk about how maybe it's all just the same time period because those first two dates are about four or 500 AD. And then the earlier one that goes almost into 400 AD, this is the one that everyone says is 200 BC or whatever, uh, that is, was the earliest date in Grenada. It's probably intrusive. It might have maybe a crab was digging there and it got moved around or something happened and it got moved. But up until uh, about two months ago or so, that was the earliest site still, even though it's really late for 500 AD. Um, but just before I left last October, uh, we found a site at Bujaju. So I'll, I'll, talk about, I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, just to go over quickly what the project is, so I made these predictive models based on where site, known sites are, especially sites with radiocarbon dates, and good, good ceramics that we know what the ceramic date or what the culture would be, um, and kind of tried to make an idea of areas that were really high potential for earlier sites. I can't test everything, so this was a good way to kind of pinpoint areas that were really high probability. And so that's what we did. Um, we also did a bunch of soil uh, analysis, especially phosphorus. Phosphorus is um, a major indicator of, of humans. If you're going to do one kind of geochemical test, phosphorus is pretty much it. Humans are always messing with it. And it's a major element uh, for plants, right? You usually fertilize your plants with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It's kind of finite in, in nature, and plants conserve it. Not as much as nitrogen, but they conserve it. And when you plant crops and you take those crops and harvest them, you redeposit all that phosphorus that was in the plant in one spot. And so you get these high concentrations of phosphorus where humans were processing plants or animals or whatever, right? Burials are going to be high in this phosphorus. So um, through some geochemical tests, we did this. And the really cool thing, to show you a couple examples of, of it, here's the survey we did along Antoine Bay. So we took these auger tests, uh, and a lot of this is, is this later pottery, same stuff you find at Solitary's Bay. Uh, and then you get um, this map, and you can kind of see in the green uh, areas of high phosphorus, and it's right where the sites are, but you can see kind of the site limits. Right? So as the phosphorus kind of dissipates, we know there's like a midden in this area, and that's the place to excavate. So it's a good, good indication, and you can see how it just pops up. Even the site of Calabas, we weren't really sure where it was because we were just getting little bits of ceramic, uh, but it really popped out in the phosphorus, and High Cliff Point is off the charts. With, with it, so we knew exactly where the, the concentration was with that. Uh, another site was um, Grand Bacolet. This is another one that we knew there was a site somewhere in the area, but we weren't really sure. We walked up, and it was high probability. Uh, we walked up a river, we found just pottery, that's in the corner, just pottery falling into the river. And I was like, all right, awesome, let's do some auger tests up at the top. And that's what all these little X's are. And then this is a three-dimensional version, kind of, of what I showed you ago. And this is horizontal, but the green areas are where it's really high. So you have kind of two middens. It might be actually a disturbance in the middle there. So the whole area might, uh, might be green, or was originally green. OK, Bujaju. So like I said, up until uh, a couple months ago, um, Pearls was always considered the earliest site. It might still be, but the radiocarbon dates don't show that. And what I was really surprised was uh, just before I left, uh, my colleague or counterpart at the ministry called me to a site that was under construction. So it is that um, they just repaved the road and they, it's kind of a new community up uh, and right outside of Bujuju Bay. So it's all ripped up, but there was pottery all over the place, up in the piles between the road. And unfortunately, this is how sites are usually found in Grenada, because there are no law, well, there's no laws that are enforced um, uh, to do assessments before construction or before things are destroyed. Luckily, um, the foreman had the foresight to call uh, the ministry and tell them that there was this site. And I was able to get some charcoal that was next to what seemed to be a burial. There were some human bones inside a vessel. Uh, and those dates, when we ran the radiocarbon dates, ended up being like crazy early. Of course, I didn't know that until I left, and it was like in February when I got the dates back. But um, so Bujuju, the really 
about uh, three, four hundred AD. So you can see how it's earlier than pearl stains. These are the two, two, two dates in Persia. We're going to do some more testing in an excavation there um, pretty soon. But uh, again, it's really late still. It's, it's the same kind of pottery. I mean, when I saw the pottery, I was thinking it must be early. And it looks just like, um, see the white on red in the corner there? That's the earliest kind of pottery we see. And there's tons of it everywhere. I mean, if, if this, there was going to be an early site, this was going to be it. If it was going to be something in the BCs, 100 BC something, right? I wanted to be right. I mean, that was my hypothesis. Grenada was, had to be early. It's the first island that must have been settled early. And then we get three to 400 AD. Real, real quick, um, so these, this is the ceramic progression I was talking about. You know, white on red. There's other kinds of things. You have these adornos um, that come associated with white on red. But uh, they show up a little bit later. They're usually called bronchoid influenced. Um, and then you get a type of pottery that we call tramassin tramasoid. Um, in Grenada, it's also called Calavini. It's the Calavini site had a lot of these swirl, um, red and black geometric lines. And then you get into the Swayzen pottery, which is pretty later. And this is the stuff that Ripley Bolin identified at um, Sven Swayze. And he was sure this was Caribs because uh, if you see this little, I know it's hard to see, but this little piece of pottery there, it's called finger indented. That's what he called it. And the uh, um, next piece there is scratched. It looks like someone just scratched the pottery when it was still wet, right? So this is kind of a crude people, cave people putting, slapping together pottery, right? This is what he's imagining. They're very warlike, right? They're just savages. And so they're artistically destitute. They couldn't possibly be creating anything like the saladoid stuff you see earlier, right? So he's like, these are definitely the Caribs. This is the group. Unfortunately, None of the radiocarbon dates or any, there was, well, until recently, were there sways in pottery associated with historic colonial pottery, glassware, things like that you would see when Europeans show up. Um, so it was pretty definitively knocked out. And you can see the progression too. It's kind of, this, this doesn't show it as well, but Calavini pottery and Swayze pottery are basically the same people. He took the utilitarian wares, the crappy stuff that people just use in their day-to-day, -day, and he said, this is Swayze, Swayzoid, sometimes it's called. And then the really nice stuff, he said, was Calavini, and this is earlier. And he actually thought this was when the Caribs came in, even some of his articles talks about how these Arawakan women making Calavini pottery must have looked down on the, the Swayzoid women who were making this cruddy pottery, slapping together finger-indented rims and things like that, right? But really, they all date to the same time period. It's probably the same ceramic horizon, it, it seems like. And so you have the nice stuff at Calavini. And at Calavini, you also get the Swayze stuff. So um, they're all kind of the same period. And then from there, you can kind of see how it progresses from the Saladoid period. And the Adornos you get during the Swayze period are more, are more um, anthropomorphic. So you get human-like Adornos versus these animal ones you see, like at pearls. You go to pearls, you find these things all over, right? They're like, they're animals though, they're not humans. Um, and they're very Barrancoid-esque, uh, as, as we would say, based on a site in Venezuela called Barrancas, where you also find tons of this stuff. And then there's a piece that's downstairs, the Calavini polychrome, and that is like the piece that you always see in whenever anyone mentions Calavini, it's like that pot, <laughs> um, the one we have downstairs. Uh, okay, so that's the progression. So I've sort of rearranged things now based on reassessing all of the sites, going through all the literature, all the past work um, that archaeologists had done, things that had never been published that we found upstairs, um, tons of pottery down that were stuffed down the basement at the museum. We brought up stuff that was never analyzed. And so now I have this new chart of sort of the progression showing saladoid bronchoid going much later in Grenada. And, and the earliest sites really 300 AD. Maybe there's a 200 AD, but that's as far as I'm hoping now. Like I, I'm really not completely ruling out anything earlier, but there's just there's nothing to go on. Um, so I made a quick little gif of uh, progression through time. So I'll let it play more. So this is the Tramasoid um, Swayze Calavini times orange. And then blue is the Cayo. So red is the Saladoid, 3, 4, 500 AD. This is the number of sites 
um, at each period, at least sites that we know definitively have that kind of pottery. Sometimes you can't tell what type of pottery it is, so those sites aren't on there. I think there's about 50 sites in this cycle. So one thing you notice um, is there's a huge population explosion during this about 800 AD, right? You get a lot of people, or you get a lot of sites all of a sudden, and then they kind of drop down uh, in historic period. So that's kind of a mystery right now, is what's going on during that period, and um, how does it relate? There are uh, some of the other islands, like St. Vincent also has a population boom, it seems like. Um, but then in the Leeward Islands, you have a depopulation of people. Uh, they often call it like a no man's land between Caribs and, and Taino. But based on what I just said, maybe that's not really what's going on, so we're not really sure. So getting into the last section, which is much shorter, is uh, in order to, to continue to learn about these sites, we have to try to protect them more, right? So I think we kind of have an ethical, really a moral responsibility to protect and save the things that lasted this long from our ancestors. And I'm, I'm saying our ancestors because this is just world history. This is just important to everybody, how these people lived, how they changed the environment, how they managed, how the landscape now, like I said, pawpaw trees and, and avocado and stuff are based on these people that had showed up thousands of years ago. And they're all being pretty well destroyed. This is just a couple examples, but every site that I've visited has a problem, and these are some of the more drastic ones. So even the site of Span Swayze, which is the only type site in Grenada um, that when an archaeologist finds that scratched pottery anywhere in the Caribbean, they're going to call it Swayze. They don't always use the word Calavini. Um, and then often they'll just say Tramas and Tramasoid or Saladoid. So all these sites still have problems. There's illegal dumping, there's sand mining. I don't know what's going on with Levera. It's a mess. There's a site there at Levera where they're building an ecotourist um, artificial environment thing, golf course, uh, it, but they, they destroyed a site in the process. Um, so there needs to be more protection, right? There needs to be stronger laws. One thing is that there are laws on the books they are just not enforced. So I think as Grenada continues to develop, um, this is something that we should you know, think about as the population expands and there's only going to be more people and more people and more people and start laying down the framework of how to handle this stuff now would be really important. And of course, there's an idea in social sciences called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. In any society or any person, you have to take care of the basic stuff first, food, water, health, security. So this is almost a model for development too. We've moved on past these things. There's still a lot of poverty, but we're continually to be developed and as we start to get towards this top of the period of more just caring about, you know, people start to care more about heritage when, you know, you're fed and you're protected and you have, you know, things are, are, going, are going better. But one uh, aspect of this is that these sites could actually assist in the development of, of the continued development of Grenada. There's actually an economic aspect to it. Oh, so there's actually 17 laws that are currently gazetted and that just aren't enforced that could be used to protect archaeological sites or to make construction companies um, do some sort of assessment before, they're, before they destroy it, or you know, there's just not a big push for it. Um, and then, of course, there's a myriad of plans, policies, recommendations over the years that, that have listed sites that should be protected. And I think the more we start to talk about it, eventually something will happen, so that's why I'm... But so there's this idea of heritage tourism. This is just a basic uh, outline of what that entails, but you have these cultural assets, basically, Mount Rich petroglyph and Duquesne petroglyphs and all these sites that I'm talking about. You know, those are sort of capital, and they could draw people in to the area if we were to develop it in that way, right? Uh, and so there's a value to, uh, for stakeholders, and I'm a stakeholder too as an archaeologist. The value for me, especially, is the research, um, and the value to the community might be that People are coming there and they can sell things. Or there might also be identity involved, uh, you know, a pride in having this petroglyph site. And there's a group at Mount Rich that I'm working with right now that, that that's kind of the way they see that, that stone. I'll, I'll mention them again in a second. So this is kind of the general process. And these kinds of tourists, I mean, they're already here. People come back for genealogy. They come back to 
don't know what they call farming or agricultural tourism. You know, you could pick pineapples in Hawaii. Well, here you could pick cocoa in Grenada, right? So that's kind of a cool thing. And these are people that stay longer than your average cruise ship passenger, right? They're here for a little bit of time. Usually that means they also have a little more money. They have the propensity to stay for a week instead of two days. And they're usually a, a, a bit of a higher education. They're interested in the heritage and, and seeing the culture, the culture of Grenada. And I'm, I don't mean just the Mary Indian sites, it's historical sites, and even just cultural things. Maroon Fest, for instance, is a great heritage kind of tourism. Heritage sort of pervades tourism. Whenever you travel anywhere in the country or out the country, you're, often there's always something revolving culture that you're interested in. I mean, some countries, that's the main draw. Rome, uh, Italy, Rome, and Egypt, and Israel, and Jerusalem, and Hadrian's Wall you know, in England. Th these are things that people are drawn to that are heritage sites. So usually about 50 to 80% of tourism involves something like that. So this is something that Grenada can continue to, uh, to push. And of course, protecting these sites adds more value. So in the, in the US, we have the National Park Service and a National Register of Historic Places. And when those sites are listed, it kind of adds a legitimacy to them. So people say, oh yeah, I want to go see that site. It's, uh, it's on the Historic Register. You know, it adds a little bit to it. So if we had a register, of which there have been recommendations and numerous sites, including the fort, things like that, uh, that were actually protected and listed that way, it kind of gives it a branding. Eventually, we're hoping to do the World um, UNESCO uh, World Heritage site, but that seems to, every couple of years, it's like two steps forward, or one step forward, two steps back, but hopefully, maybe eventually, and some of these archaeological sites will be part of that. La uh, second to last slide. So I mentioned this group up in Mount Rich. We're developing um, uh, a number of rock art sites through uh, especially the, the western side of the country. So St. John's River, we just moved a work stone out front the, um, the stadium. If you go by, it's still being developed. There's gonna be a sign there, and I think a fountain they're planning. Grand Mall Bay, there's also a work stone. It's a big, these are big stones where stone tools will be made. But during the ceramic period, um, I could talk about work stones uh, later if you're, if you're interested. And then all the petroglyph sites. And of course, this map, highlights one interesting little thing is that you know all the petroglyphs are in the w northwest side of the island we don't really know really what's going on there why there's not really any I mean, there are a few work stones in st david's and st andrews but there's no petroglyphs so this group uh Mycedo and mount rich which is where the mount rich petroglyph is if you haven't been up there i highly recommend it. it's right up the road from belmont and they just redid a building you can see them painting this is a group that actually kind of took ownership of it. It's a bunch of kids, um, and this was a couple years ago, so now they're getting older, some of them have, kid, have their own kids. They want to develop this as a stop uh, on basically this uh, corridor that we're calling the Petroglyph Path, and, it, and that's kind of the end highlight. So I would encourage you, if maybe in August is what we're shooting for the opening, to stop up Mount Rich and see what, what they're doing, maybe buy some guava cheese or something to support them. Because it's a really cool thing that I, that I think we should really push for. And then uh, all of the sites that uh, I've been documenting and putting together are, went into an access database and a big report called the status of our, uh, Grenada's prehistoric sites, which is online now um, if you search for it. And the access database is online too, but it's kind of wonky because it's MS access. So I'm actually converting it to a website, which I hope to be done soon, that's the front end of it, and then uh, and the back end is we're inputting all the, the database, and there'll be, a, there'll be a public version of it, and then there'll be a version also for the ministry with some other information, and they can edit um, and add things. So all the reports will be on there, um, a lot of information about these 84 sites, and the sites that we continue to find. Uh, I guess before I go to questions, I don't want to leave out the acknowledgments, because obviously everything I just presented is... I didn't do on my own. So there were a lot of people, especially, um, well, U.S. Embassy, I didn't mention on there, but I'm on a Fulbright scholarship here now, so I, uh, everyone at the, the U.S. Embassy played a part in this. There, I also had a grant from American Philosophical Society. Oh, I did mention it. Gurney National Museum has always been a big supporter of the work that I've done. Marsh Bishop Airport Authority let me in to some of those sites around Point Celine. The Board of Tourism um, and also the Ministry of Tourism. Um, and then a, a list of people uh, 
uh, workers that I hired, other historians and uh, archaeologists. So, right. Uh, so, any questions? Sorry if that went a little, it was about an hour. Robert. When you arrived in Grenada, as a peace school worker, did you have any idea of archaeological work, or is it because of your interest in people that you're working for the archaeology now? Right, thanks. Um, yeah, it was after I arrived. I mean, I didn't know much at all about the archaeology. I had done archaeology in the States, and I studied anthropology in university, and that was my degree, but I really downplayed it as a Peace Corps. I kind of gave it up, because it wasn't the best kind of work. I was moving, I traveled all over the U.S. and staying out of hotels, and it was like a very transient kind of existence. I kind of gave it up um, when I came, when I joined the Peace Corps, and so I would just I played up teaching computers and science, teaching science, things like that. But then, I especially worked with um, Michael Jessime at the Ministry of Tourism, and also here at the museum. Uh, I started to, to bring that up, and then we, we ended up doing this um, program at St. John's River, uh, right by Queens Park, which is what that work stone that's now in front of the stadium, it's the site that the work stone is associated with. So I ended up doing that in Peace Corps, and that led that got me back into archaeology, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other uh, questions? I think um, it was a particular school that I could make you remember. I didn't hear mention the site of these. Right, so that's another term. Yeah, yeah, no, what's funny, um, I hear that a lot in Grenada, and I think also St. Vincent, I think maybe Kirby is the one responsible for this. So Sibony, uh, let me see if I have that slide. Sibini are actually, uh, so if, from an archaeological standpoint, the term Sibini is used to describe the, the early um, stone tool makers that come out of Central America. That's really the Sibini. And at the time uh, uh, Columbus landed and, and the early Europeans, there was a group called the Guantanabe. Uh, that lived in the western part of Cuba that were that they were told just lived as savages in caves and made stone tools. It seems like they really did still exist. Um, there's some argument now that actually the Taino and the, the Taino were a little were different than a little different down here. Like I said, the language might be different, and they also had a little bit more complex political system. Uh, but they may have pushed out whatever archaic people were in the Dominican Republic and Cuba. So the word Sibini was always used for that. But then you hear about it down here to describe the archaic period. I think that's usually what. But like I said, there's no real evidence for the archaic period. So all the stone tools that we find are associated with ceramics, not anything earlier. Good question, though, yeah. Yes. Well, uh, until until the poetry, I th yeah, you know, on that slide, I think I mentioned. Where's that slide? I kind of rushed through that. Right, there's about 20 Cayo sites now, and a bunch in um, Grenada, which dates the contact period. But up until 1994, I think, when the first real Cayo site, Argyle in St. Vincent. Um, was confirmed that well, yeah, this, and it had they had actually glassware and and um, and things that were trade goods with Europeans that are in the pottery. So you have like these designs on the pottery with like European goods in it. So it's like no doubt that this is contact period. But so this is why La Poetry is so important because it is a contact period site. Yeah. Maybe, but we don't know. I mean, it was shipped all over. Yeah. 
Do you have a record of all the sites? Because they truckloads of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good to know. I, I mean, I would be relieved to know that. For uh, what what site? La Follette. Right. It was like 7,800 AD. Um, which one? Uh, the, river, the River Antoine? I didn't date that because I didn't have good charcoal from that sample. I didn't, t I didn't, I only did the one auger test, so I didn't do the, I didn't do the um, phosphorus there. Because really need a, you need at least like three to triangulate. And I, I could go back, but I kind of felt like I was on Leiden's turf when I was there, so I didn't really want to... Because Leiden is doing similar stuff. I don't want to step on their toes. Yeah. The, 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 the research, no one university has authority to monitor Leiden. Right. Because it's not the only university in the country. Right. But I mean, if, I, like, if they went to Bujajun and started digging, I would be kind of upset because like, I found the site. I'm like, trying to get the funds to work on it, and then they snoop, swoop in. Usually there's kind of an etiquette that you don't, but yeah. But I could be Yeah, that there are these Galibis, yeah. Right, right. But they're living there. Exactly, yeah, this is, yeah. You come close to the linguistic part of it where you say that, yes, it was basically two different languages, and the Arab languages, which the people of the Caribbean spoke, are. So you have no distinction between the Chinese and the Caribbean. Right. They are one people. Yeah, they spoke the same language, yeah. Definitely. Different researchers have come to different opinions yeah. as to what is and what, you know. I mean, I took my grandmother oral story and I developed it into a scientific novel. Mm -hmm. And I have a scientific novel. Just as a report to right. the men in Canada, where the oral history of the IP and they did it up because yeah, of the scientific That's what you need. Right, I think you're right. It's uh, it is very confusing, and it's still yeah. And like, what I presented was sort of on the verge of, of course, sort of the, some of this is like kind of the cutting edge. Well, is is it true? You know, did did these islands get skipped early or why and. Right.
Exactly. Right. It all kind of dates to 500 AD. Yeah, yeah, I think 1957, yeah. I know, we need a better one, yeah. <laughs> you should write it then. Yeah, it's something you have to test basically on an AMS, an accelerator mass spectrometer machine. I was lucky enough that Penn State, like my advisor deals with radiocarbon, like he's a, he does a lot of radiocarbon stuff and he actually uh, got a huge grant and we just started, we just got an AMS machine that's just for radiocarbon dating. And it's actually not even, well it's not really gonna be commercial but we're only kind of doing in-house stuff. So all the dates that I ran you know, I just got lucky to have this. Otherwise, I'd have to pay a lot more money to send it away. But so, a quick thing about radiocarbon, because that question does come up a lot. Um, you know, anything alive is breathing and ingesting the air, or even in the sea, there's carbon, right? So you think of what's in the air, there's nitrogen, there's water, oxygen, um, and there's carbon dioxide. And attached to that carbon dioxide is carbon, right? It's carbon and oxygen, right? So any element, I think I have a chart here. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so the periodic table. So any element on here, um, you know, if you took a gold bar and you zoomed in on a microscope as far as you possibly can, all the atoms are gonna look exactly the same. They're a basic fundamental element. And then, oh, AG is silver, same thing. If you were to zoom in on a piece of silver, you would get that. If you zoomed in on this book, you'd get a whole bunch of different atoms, right? Made up of these periodic atoms. Now, carbon is, um, uh, is one of these, and it's in air, and, um, and usually, now there's, all of these elements tend to have things called isotopes, which are variants of, of the element. So carbon-12 is like the predominant kind, it means it has, what, 12 electrons. Uh, but then every once in a while there'll be a 13th one. So I think it's like 8% of all the carbon atoms have this 13th electron. And it's still pretty stable, but it's a little bit unstable. This is where you start to get radioactivity. So you add a 14th atom and it's radioactive. It, it wants to get rid of this electron, right? So it, it's carbon and it has 14. But the way that that even happens actually is from nitrogen. So nitrogen has four, the most common kind of nitrogen is N14, which has 14 electrons. And that's just in the air. So you get, what happens is you get photons from the sun. Every once in a while they hit a nit nitrogen and they knock out a proton, which changes the element from nitrogen to carbon. So nitrogen is seven, has seven protons. As soon as you knock out a proton, it becomes something else. Uh, and it knocks one out and becomes a six, and that's carbon. But it's got 14 electrons still. It's super radioactive. The thing about radioactive elements is that they get rid of their, they get rid of the extra electron at a, at a, um, a known rate. It's like a clock. So you just count the number of carbon-14 in a sample, and, well, you have to know how much carbon-14 is generally in the atmosphere, and then you count the number that's in the sample, and you can see how much has deteriorated. Now, what we didn't realize in 1950 when they discovered this was that there's different levels of carbon throughout, throughout time. It changes, especially after the industrial age, and then the nuclear weapons testing all just totally messed up the atmosphere with all sorts of radioactive nitrogen. So um, you can't really use the, the current atmosphere now, but through tree rings especially, um, also cores, 
we can go back about 40 to 50,000 years and know how much carbon, carbon 12 and 14 was in the environment at that time. And then you count the amount that's in the sample and you can get an, a date. So that's called calibration. The way you count the amount in the sample is through the AMS machine. So it counts the atoms. That's kind of a quick, yeah. Sorry, yeah. About that. Yeah. Yes. Of this? Yeah, that's so the whole nother thing. Really know well, uh, the biggest things are the hemispheres, so northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, there's different air masses, different amounts of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, and, uh, and that changes with the ITCZ and the, the wet and dry season happening. That's the movement of southward hemisphere up or northern hemisphere down, right? So you get these intermixes. They're pretty close. Um, the other big thing is um, water and the ocean. So the amount of carbon in the ocean uh, is about 400 years behind the atmosphere. That's actually the issue with the pearls dates is that they were shell and they didn't apply the marine curve to it, they just used the atmospheric curve. So actually when they said the pearls dates, they were just saying what it would be if it was charcoal but it was a shell, so that animal was ingesting what we call the old water effect of um, all the carbon that's in the, the ocean. Now, you could get carbon that's pretty close in the, in the ocean um, to the atmosphere, but it has to be a really sloshy, active environment. I don't know if, you know, there might be some places in the world where the amount of carbon in the water is the same as the atmosphere, just because the exchange is so active. But in the ocean, you get these deep, you know, currents and then upwelling of this old water. So it's about generally about 400 years behind. So that those are the those are the big ones. But we're always figuring out. It depends on also the diet. So you date someone a human bone. You know, you can date human bones because there's carbon in the bone. And as soon as the animal dies, that starts to deteriorate. Right? There's no they're no longer ingesting it. Um, but if that person eats fish all the time, if that's all they eat then you might want to add the marine curve to it because the carbon that they're ingesting, but it's mixed with the atmosphere. And so that's a big, those are the kinds of things, but we're always thinking about that stuff. There's also, if you date a piece of charcoal, you know, what part of the tree? Is it the outermost part of the tree or is that tree some old, you know, I have a mango tree in my yard. It's like a hundred years old. If we dated the inner part of that tree, you're going to be a hundred years off than what, than um, what the outer part of the tree was. So there's, we're always thinking of stuff like that, yeah. Good. That's an excellent question, and there are books written about, <laughs> about it. Yeah. One uh, observation, we didn't discuss the kind of migration, uh, so we made the migration of the product. Um, if you look at some of my discovery, the isotopes, they show that they came from the Andes. It was not in relationship to the Andes. Um, but yet still, the country of the and the collection that I have would be a story. So there is identical factory related to the identical related to the greater Andes and identical factory related to the Venice. Yeah. Well, there's strong evidence for the Guyanas. It's much more stronger than... The evidence the is the Yeah, I mean, you don't get white on red. Yeah. But the, the Columbia thing is... The isotopes. Yeah, so you definitely have trade. You know, maybe people... I mean, that's what this... That's what they were kind of saying is maybe even Columbia... Some, um, some of these groups could have come from. And there's a constant movement of people. You know, uh, at the time of contact, the, the ethno-historians, the, the missionaries and stuff that are writing these books, I mean, they talk about just masses of you know, hundreds of pirogues, these canoes just going back and forth to the, to the, um, to the mainland. So, I mean, you, and you probably always had that throughout prehistory. There's definitely contacts, you know, to Colombia, maybe, I don't know if direct contact with the Andes, but down the line exchange. There are those condor pendants. That's what I was really looking for. 
These, um, the type of pottery you're talking about is probably hueca, uh, which, is a, which seems to be very similar to the stuff that's on the coast of Ecuador, Colombia, and maybe the end. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I think the, over the next couple of years is really going to... Yeah. With the Grenadines? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, all over, you know. And a lot of it is this legacy of... Uh, I don't know about, I mean, the Grenadines are also late, the dates are really late, so the stuff like Karyaku and all are 300 AD, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely carrying, I mean, you just think, you know, you're going on a long trip, you're going to bring a couple pawpaw, and look at all the seeds in that. I mean, it, you don't even have to intentionally plant a pawpaw seed, that thing is going to grow wherever you throw that, right? So. You know, that's the kind of, that's what, we call that like domesticating the landscape. It's just a, an unintentional way of making it more hospitable. The next person that comes by, there's going to be a pawpaw tree and they're going to eat some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said it was a site that you have with some of the information. A website? Yeah, um, well, we're making the website. It'll be on the museum website. Uh, you know, I should put a link. Right now we have some teacher kits and stuff on the website uh, that, that, and we might use this lecture as we're recording it to, um, to, to build a teacher kit off of this. Uh, but I'll put the, um, that report, well the status, the status of Grenada's uh, prehistoric, or, uh, prehistoric sites. I'll put that on the, the museum site. And also the access database, although it's kind of wonky, so you might want to wait. Probably a couple weeks I'll have the website. Done. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming and listening to me rant on and on. So, thank you. I think there's some food and there's some um, light snacks and uh, some drinks in the back. So, help yourself. <laughs>